There are as many definitions of atheism on the web as there are grains of sand. I know this because every time I attempt to define it, I get a barrage of emails telling me that I am wrong, and then another definition is given. Some of them even contradict each other. It seems the poor atheists really are confused people, and what is sad, most of them don't have a clue how confused they are. They scream out that they don't believe in God, and then they spend most of their life attempting to tear down and explain away the existence of the God they say they don't believe in. But at the risk of more emails, here is the definition of atheism from Princeton University. Atheism. Godlessness, the doctrine or belief that there is no God. Or a lack of belief in the existence of God or gods. In short, the declaration that there is no God or one who simply chooses to have no belief in a God or gods is atheism. Pretty simple to understand. The definition of evolution. Talk Origins is a website profusely quoted by evolutionists all over the web, so we will take our definitions from their web page. First, we will hear the definition of macroevolution. The definition of microevolution is not debated by most Christians. Microevolution, or the scientific evidence for small changes within species and kinds, is indisputable and even spoken of in the Bible. Macroevolution, however, is another matter. Here is its definition. In evolutionary biology today, macroevolution is used to refer to any evolutionary change at or above the level of species. It means at least the splitting of a species into two or the change of a species over time into another. Very interesting admission, the change of a species over time into another. Yes, this is the theory of evolution that we Christians speak against all the time. One kind of living thing turning into another kind of living thing over time. And yet, there is not one piece of solid scientific evidence anywhere in the world to prove that this has ever happened, anytime, anywhere, ever. But that is the theory of evolution, macroevolution. The lack of fossil evidence, for example, for macroevolution became so embarrassing to the evolutionists, they are called missing links, that now, just recently, have formulated an even more incredulous story. They now claim that the totality of the fossils taken together tell the story of evolution. Ah, yes, the story. The story indeed. Here is what they will say. This is a much simplified version, of course, but still propositionally accurate. They will say, here we have a fish fossil and a monkey fossil and a human fossil with other fossils in between. So one can clearly see how the fish became a man. Richard Dawkins' book, The Ancestor's Tale, makes this very proposition. Evolution theory is truly getting very, very desperate and strange. So desperate that just recently an extinct lemur fossil was brought forth by evolution scientist and paleontologist, and it was called Eda. And it was declared to be our oldest living relative. Really? By what scientific proof? Oh yes, that's right. It's a part of the story. Don't forget the story. Another definition worth noting, again from the Talk Origins website, that of theistic evolution. An interpretation of Genesis 1 in which the storyline is considered as an explanation for the why and who of creation, but not the exact method. Of course, this definition allows for evolution to be the method that is used to, quote, create. Then, Talk Origins website proposes another question with its answer. Doesn't evolution contradict religion? Their answer, not always. Certainly it contradicts a literal interpretation of the first chapter of Genesis. Aha! And there is the real answer. Yes, evolution does contradict biblical Christianity. But not all religions or religious ideas, of course. But it does contradict biblical Christianity. Exactly. The first chapter of Genesis states that God created everything in six days. The only contextual rendering of the six days is a literal solar cycle, literal day periods. Genesis chapter 2 verse 1 says that by the seventh day all had been created and God said that it was very good. But the modern theory of evolution declares that all things are still evolving or in the process of creating and recreating themselves. One kind of living thing is becoming another kind of living thing accidentally which doesn't just contradict the first two chapters of Genesis, 
but it denies the first two chapters of Genesis. So theistic evolution sounds good. It even sounds like a viable compromise, but it is fatally flawed from the outset, especially to the biblical Christian. And to be completely honest, almost every true evolutionist denies the existence of any intelligent designer. If you don't believe it, just suggest to an evolutionist that there is an intelligent designer and then prepare yourself. Here's a definition of biblical Christianity as it relates to this topic. One who believes that the Bible is the only and infallible word of God. One who believes that Jesus is God with us and the only way to salvation. And also, one who believes that God and God alone created the heavens and the earth and all that is in them. He did it in six days, just as his word says. There was no process of macroevolution involved. There never was, there never will be. Again, very simple to understand, and might I add, supported by much verifiable, documented, observable, and testable scientific evidence. We have many films that make this case clearly. But here is the bottom line to the whole matter. Since a staunch evolutionist would deny the existence of an intelligent designer of any type, and the atheist obviously denies the existence of God or chooses not to believe in a God, then the evolutionist and the atheist have no moral authority to which to answer. They live by whatever moral code they decide is right. As the Bible says in the book of Judges, every man did what was right in his own eyes. Therefore, under these systems, evolution and atheism, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, abortion, pornography, etc., are all moral allowables, depending upon the whims and norms of any particular society. Ah, how convenient. Now we get to the crux of the matter. It really does become a philosophical issue, a heart issue, if you will, much more than one of a pure unadulterated science issue or an exercise in cranial synapse firing. The Christian looks to a standard outside of himself, bigger than himself, a standard given by his creator. The standard calls us to a higher life and promises us another life to come. The Bible speaks to adultery, fornication, homosexuality, abortion, and pornography, for example and calls them all detestable to God and never allowable for any culture at any time. In other words, the Christian understands that there are moral absolutes and an accountability to those absolutes. Since none of us watching this film will likely live past 80 or 90 years total, then we all really have a very short time to do this thing called life. Mr. Evolutionist and Mr. Atheist, continue to do what is right in your own eyes. If you are right about all this stuff called life and your egocentric, selfish theories, if we did come from a chimp's ancestor, and if there is no God and there are no moral absolutes, then oh well. I have enjoyed my life with much peace and hope and purpose, and you have lived your life the way you wanted. It will be the end of the matter. But if the creationist is right, if the Bible is right, well then that is another whole matter indeed. And it certainly won't be the end of it. Something to think about.